everybody. Um, this is the Netscaler presentation. Kind of a, a really, uh, there's so much to the Netscaler that it's hard to cover a lot in one hour. But I'll try to do my best to cover at least, give you a good feel for what it can do, what it is, and um, you know what it can do for you, why you would use it, stuff like that. So, um, just my background. Um, I created a YouTube channel called Netscaler Trainer, and it's linked to my website n90x.info. And um, I'm a master trainer for the Netscaler with over 200,000 views and 1,000 subscribers off of two Netscaler channels. The second Netscaler channel is, is controlled by Altercom, which is one of the partners, Citrix partners. I also have a Netscaler CCA, Netscaler Certified Netscaler Administrator, and also a Nets, uh, Citrix Certified Sales Professional, just to kind of give you my background. So what things we're going to cover today are the models, with the, there's physical, <coughs> And there's virtual Netscaler appliances, so we're going to talk about that. Also, cover some of the use cases, the primary use cases, why you would use a Netscaler, what is what it's good for. Also, the deployment topologies. So, how you can deploy it. There's diff many different ways to, to deploy it. Cover those topologies pretty briefly, and then I have a, a brief demo. But I want to sh show you a little bit under the hood how it's working, and. Um, maybe go through a little bit of configuration but not a, not a whole lot we don't have a whole lot of time and then we'll have it some some time for questions so the Netscaler models there's obviously the MPX which is physical you know appliance which is the current current model naming scheme there's the VPX which is the virtual appliance which runs on various virtualization or hypervisor platforms and there's the Netscaler SDX which is um, well, we'll get into what it is, but it's basically a custom-built or purpose-built hypervisor for the Netscaler, and we'll talk about that. So the <clears throat> main differences between MPX and VPX, besides physical and virtual, obviously this is performance. The MPX is a purpose-built hardware appliance dedicated to doing web acceleration, SSL offloading, caching, compression, all these different things. It's purposely built. And there, there are ASICs um, to support that. So, for instance, there's this custom crypto ASIC that accelerates SSL connections, uh, which you. So that's what you would have on the MPX. You would not have that on the VPX. Obviously, if you're running it in a virtual system, virtual server, your own hardware, you're not going to have dedicated hardware for that. When, when to use which? So, you know, the the appliances, the physical appliances. Basically, think about if you're in a real heavy duty production environment, you're going to want to have the hardware appliances. Um, if you're in a lab or testing, certainly the VPX is fine. Also, there is a use case for if you really need highly CPU intensive workloads, it's going to be more cost effective for you to get, say, uh, I don't know, a, a dual 8-core server. So now you've got uh, 16 CPUs that can run uh, CPU intensive, let's say, um, filtering. On, on each pack because the Netscaler can do deep pack and inspection. So that that's one of the use cases that's been been brought about. The the SDX as I started to talk about the Netscaler SDX. This is a purpose built. You know, essentially think of it as a custom version of Citrix Zen server in a box, but specifically built to host Netscaler VPX instances, not partitions, but instances. So. On this hardware appliance, you can run multiple instances of the VPX, and they don't have to be the same version. So, it's very great, great, very good for if you if you're a in a co-location type business. You can obviously support multiple users in this environment, right? With with a single appliance, you can host multiple users. Each one is isolated, memory is isolated, administration is isolated. So you could very quickly and easily administer or spin up Netscalers for ver multiple clients or for multiple, let's say, multiple versions of, of the VPX. Let's say if you're doing a, um, a migration, it would be very easy to, to have, let's say, version 10.5 versions and then also version 11, do your migration on an SDX. So some of the use cases, we kind of talked about it a little bit, but look, any web-based application that you want to have better performance on, the Netscaler can help. And, it, and, and we'll talk about how it does it, but 
Server offload is one of the ways it helps. It offloads the load on the server, backend servers. And we'll see how that works. SSL offload is one of those things, so the server isn't having to generate the, the key, key pairs, right, and do encryption, decryption. That's offloaded onto the Netscaler. So that's one way where you're offloading the load. Also a thing called multiplexing, where the Netscaler opens up a few connections to the backend servers, and it multiplexes that. That means it uses one connection for multiple clients. So it also you know, lowers the memory requirements, CPU requirements of the server. We can talk about compression. The Netscaler can do compression for you. So that obviously lessens the load on the CPU of a server. And also caching, which lessens the load, less bytes that have to be sent from the backend server. Also, if you want to improve the security of your web infrastructure, you know, if you're just sitting out there, you know, maybe you have a, uh, everybody's going to have a layer three, layer four firewall, but if you need web application security or layer seven security, deep pack and inspection to stop, you know, uh, SQL injection, to stop those kind of uh, OWAPs attacks, the Netscaler is going to be a great tool for doing that. So SSL offload, we kind of mentioned, this allows you to reduce the server load. You can have higher uh, throughput. You can also have central management, your central certificate management. All your certificates now can be centrally managed on the Netscaler. They don't have to be managed on each individual server. So those are some of the benefits of having uh, the Netscaler in there doing your SSL. Kind of mentioned compression, right? Faster response because you have less bytes on the wire and better response for low bandwidth clients. And these are all policy rule based. So you can you can specify what get, gets compressed. Even you can even specify who who it gets compressed for if you wanted to. Caching again, caching reduces server load because the content is on the Netscaler. You don't have to go to the back end web server to get that content. It can be served very fast, very quickly, right from the Netscaler. And there's there's all kinds of things that the Netscaler could do. Um, like uh, for instance, if, if a website is down, the Netscaler can can send out that message. The website is down, for, for, or redirect you. Can do all kinds of stuff. And TC, TCP session management. This is one of the things that reduces the load to the back end. You're going to also have faster response time, and you have full traffic optimization and traffic security feature set in this. So typical TCP connection without the Netscaler, this is what the, your, your, the wire looks like when you're talking directly to a server. You know, you have, let's say, the server sees 11 packets to send some data, right? Open the connection, send the data, close the connection. But with the Netscaler, the Netscaler sits in between and kind of, you can think of it as acting as a proxy in a way, and it proxies that connection. So really, the Netscaler sees all 11 connections, but the backend server only sees one. It sees the GET request, and then the data gets sent from the server that, that needs to be sent. So right there, you're, you're offloading this load to the back end. Now, remember when I would give these kind of presentations, one time I had HP in the audience. I, I didn't mean to name, use the name, pick on HP, but and I was describing this and how the Netscaler could, could save customers money. They wouldn't have to buy new servers. And, of course, HP wanted to sell servers. This jaw dropped because he was, you know, obviously incensed that I would tell people, buy a Netscaler, and then you don't have to buy more servers. <laughs> so let's look at some deployment topologies. Um, the easiest one to deploy is called one-arm topology. And this is kind of what it looks like. You know, you have your infrastructure, your servers here in the back end. You have your net. You can just drop a Netscaler on the, net, on the, on the, on the network. Now, the great thing about the one-arm topology is it's, there's no interference with your existing infrastructure. You can put it on create a virtual IP, which is where the client will connect to, update DNS so that clients connect to the VIP, the, the VIP, and everything's fine. But can, can, can you see some problems with this uh, one-armed topology? Well, one of, the, one of the problems is that, look, those back-end servers potentially are still exposed to the internet. So um, in this picture, it, they're shown as, as being on a private subnet, so maybe they're not directly exposed, but if they were directly exposed and you just drop in a Netscaler, if I know the IP of the backend servers, I can get to them still, right? Uh, that's number one. Number two, all the traffic in and out is going on that one network interface. Now, certainly you could use uh, network aggregation, aggregate the links, but it's all coming in and out of that same 
connection. So that's uh, maybe a, a problem. But the cool thing is you can just drop it in any network. You're not going to interfere with anything else. And only what you configure will be handled by the Netscaler. Probably the better and the more secure topology is the two-arm topology, where the Netscaler sits in between like a firewall or is it like a proxy server. And it, it, it literally proxies every connection. All the client connections are terminated at the Netscaler on that virtual IP, which we, you create. <coughs> And all the back-end traffic is seen coming from what's known as a subnet IP, or a SNP. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. So this is the, the better um, architecture, but obviously the, what, are the, what are the issues with this? You know, it's re going to require some better planning, right? You can't just drop this in there. You're going to terminate all traffic to your back-end. So you have to obviously plan this and uh, put it in through a, in a maintenance window or what have you. But it's, it, it's very easy to do. Another way to look at the two-arm topology is like this. You know, um, on the left there, you see user requests coming in, terminated at the Netscaler. The Netscaler, number two, takes that user request, talks, sends it to the back end, receives the response, and then can re respond to the, to, the, to the client. So as a reminder, the Netscaler always proxies all connections to the back-end web servers. A couple of other topologies, uh, obviously high availability and clustering. That's traditionally Netscaler only used HA, high availability. And their argument was you want to size the Netscaler to handle 100% of your traffic such that if there was a problem and the primary unit went down, the backup or secondary as we call it, would be able to handle all of the, the load, all of the traffic. The problem, of course, is that you have 50% um, idle resources, right? Now, the clustering means that, okay, 100% of my, my appliances are being utilized, right? That may sound great, but what's the downside? If you have one failure, let's say you're at 100% capacity with two, two devices in, in a cluster. If one fails, you just lost 50% of your bandwidth, 50% of your throughput, right? So potentially 50% of your customers are, are dropped. So, but the good thing with the cluster is you can just add a, a third or a fourth into the cluster, right? So N plus one is usually the, the typical terminology for handling, you know, whatever you need plus one. So there's always that balance. So maybe you're using 50% across three of them. If you lose one, now you're at 75 across two. So that's the good thing about clustering. But you know, with all, with all of these topologies, there's, there's pluses and minuses. But I just want to point them out. The final topology I like to talk about is called Global Server Load Balancing, GSLB. And really what it is is just da a data, two data centers uh, and a disaster recovery. So you can have multiple data centers, but let's say in this case there's two data centers geographically dispersed with redundant content at both sites. And the, the, the Netscalers will talk to each other over a protocol called MIP, which is Metric Exchange Protocol. That's a proprietary Citrix protocol. It just, the, two, the, the Netscalers are just talking to each other. I don't know why the screen keeps going off. But um, the Netscalers can just talk to each other and understand where the better response is so that when a client connects to, to one of these centers, it can either stay there because it's got the better re response, or it could, reroute it to the closer data center. So, so far, on the, to summarize, we've talked about one arm, two arm, high availability, clustering, and GSLB. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's get into the demo. Uh, but before we start, I just want to talk about some of the requirements that you might need to think about. Um, if you want to do this in your, in your home lab or in, in your lab or bring it into your production environment, whatever, and, and test it out. So obviously you're going to need the Netscaler VPX. Probably you're not going to get an MPX. You're not going to get the physical hardware. It's very easy to go to Citrix.com, sign up for free, get yourself a download, um, either a VMware version, a KVM version, or a Zen server, Citrix Zen server version of the appliance, the virtual appliance, and get a 90-day trial license from Citrix to test it out. Then on the um, on your infrastructure side, you're going to definitely need three minimum of three IP addresses. You're going to need a NSIP, which is basically the Netscaler management IP. This is the IP address that you're going to use to manage the 
appliance. To utilize it, you're going to create a virtual IP or VIP. This is where client traffic is going to terminate, right? So instead of going directly to the server, they're going to terminate on the NetScaler on a VIP, a, a virtual IP. And then you need a subnet IP. This is the IP address on the NetScaler that talks to the back-end traffic, that talks to the back-end. So this is the IP address that the server will see. Um, I don't even know if I want to mention there, the subnet IP. There's a particular type of subnet IP known as a mapped IP or a MIP. Citrix in 11.0 of the firmware seems to have dropped that terminology. Basically, a MIP is just a, a backend IP that's on the same subnet as the NSIP. But so it's just basically a type of a subnet IP. So this is well, it's not sure. this is my this is my um, lab infrastructure. It's virtual. I have a HA pair of two net scalers and my NSIP or the administrative IP address for my net scalers is 10.0.2.101 and 102 um, I created a virtual IP which is where the clients are going to connect to at 2.105 that's my virtual IP and for the SSL VPN demo I've created a SSL VPN um, formerly known as uh, NetScaler Gateway, at uh, 10.0.2.110. And also the back end, the SNP is on a different subnet, so you can see it's completely isolated. It's on a 192.168.5.2 subnet. I've got three servers, red, green, and blue, and they're at 192.168.5.20.21 and .22. That's my back end. I do have an internal client that's on this network. It's a Windows machine. It's at 10.0.2.128. We may or may not need to use it, but it just want to let you know it's there. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm logged into the web uh, interface, the GUI, and in this is version 11.0, um, and they changed the GUI a little bit. A um, few things have changed, but anyway, it's very simple to install this thing. I'm, I'm not going to go through that. That's not what this is about. I just want to kind of show you what I've got going on here. So. In system, if you click on the system licenses, you can see I've got licensing green green check marks for pretty much everything. This is the platinum um, or platinum edition of the of the license. I believe they call it. They may have changed the name. Um, if we look at high availability, I have an HA pair here. The primary is known as NS2, and it's at one of one o two. 102. The, the whatever's primary can switch depending upon which order you boot them in. You can boot the second. What, what you, if you want one to be the secondary, you can boot it up first, and then in the command line you can specify stay secondary, boot the primary, then the primary will connect to the secondary, which is forced to stay secondary, and then you can force one to be primary if you want to. You can also um, fail over, you know, force a failover, force a synchronization. That kind of stuff. So I just want to show that in the high availability tab there. Now if we go, close that up, if we go to traffic management, that's where we'll find the load balancing. This load balance is just one of the features that we're talking about here. And the virtual server that I created is this one at 105, 2.105. Now, so if I connect to that, 10. Two, sorry, 10.0.2.105. I'm connecting to the back end. Three, there's three web, web servers there. Now, if I refresh, you can see that I'm, I'm cycling through. Maybe the green server didn't get started. But at least two of the three are up. Green server didn't get started. Let's start it up. What's the back end server? The, the back end um, are 192.168.5.20, 21, and 22. Yeah, exactly they are. Uh, oh, it's a, yeah, it's a Linux. It's a lamp. Lamp distribution known as a turnkey lamp. So it's an Apache website? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apache, all that kind of stuff, yeah. Uh, okay, so green is up now. Yeah. So if we cycle through, we should see green. Okay, so you can see server 1, server 2, server 3. I'm cycling through, right? This is what you might call a round robin, but it's not. This it's not using round robin. It's using least connection. It's very similar to round robin, 
But what I want to specify, tell you is that we're not limited to that. If I go into the virtual server, you can go to the, over here, advanced settings method. What is the method? And you can see it's least connection is the load balancing method, right? But if I, I can change that to almost anything that I want, right? Um, as far as how do I want to load balance to the back end. Round robin is one of them. Least connection is probably better. But certainly if I wanted to go based on destination uh, or source IP hash, there's a whole host of things that I could do. But that's just how to load balance the back end. But really what's more important is persistence, right? Once I, you know, for, for a generic website that just has simple stuff on it, you don't may, maybe you don't care what website you go to because the content's the same no matter where you go to. But if you're talking about any kind of transactional website, you want to pr be persistent. That means sticky, stickiness, stay on that website. And that's where we talk about persistence. And you can easily do that in this, in this vServer that I created, this virtual IP. Go into persistence. Where is it? Persistence, right here. And you can see persistence is set for none. But if I set a cookie, let's say I set cookie insert, that's, um, and I have a two minute timeout. If I make it zero, it'll be forever. But I just make it uh, cookie insert. Now, if I go back, I'm currently on the green server. Now I'm on the red server. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck on the red server now. I'm persistent to the red server. And that's what you want in, mo in most cases. You want to be able to load balance initially to the server that has the least number of connections and then be persistent on that server through the course of that transaction if, if that's what you need in most modern applications web applications want you want to be persistent on that server so that's just showing you low basic load balancing using least connections and then persistence using a cookie to maintain that persistence on that particular server so the next thing I want to show you is, if I go to well, uh, if I if I go to my uh, Windows machine right here, this is a Windows machine. Yeah, it's 10.0.2.128. It has no connection to the private subnet of the 192 private subnet. If I try to ping it, 192.168.5.20, the red server, it's, it's going to fail, right? There's no connection to it, right? So what I want to show you is how the SSL VPN can work. Now, um, this... 10.0. The SSL VPN. This is the web server. Remember, persistence persistence is set up still. If I refresh, I'm going to stick. I'm sticking to that to that blue server. That's where I got set, sent to first. But if I go to 10.0.2.110, um, HTTP, I will be redirected to HTTPS and the SSL VPN server. Ten dot zero dot two dot one ten. Yeah. Okay. So I, it's redirected me, right? Forcing me to go HTTPS. Here's the uh, certificate. It, it is a self-signed certificate, so there is a certificate issue. I created a test account, a local, with known as a local user on the Netscaler. But you can certainly integrate this into your LDAP or your um, Radius authentication stuff, right? So you don't have to do anything new or different. Now, if I I'm logged into this SSL VPN, or it's actually TSL 1.1, but we still refer to it as a SSL VPN. Now, um, because this is a self-signed certificate, the Netscaler plugin, which is available for OS X, Windows, and I think Linux. I'm not 100% sure on the Linux one, but um, it's not gonna it's not gonna work because I haven't. Um, copied over the the intermediate search for the self self signed certificate but I can do clientless access now if I do clientless access it's just basically a web-based client um, 
accessing the SSL VPN and we'll see what we, what we can do now. So it is a little bit limited in what it can do, but it's it's still very powerful. So for instance, before as you saw, I'm, I'm on a 10 dot whatever network, I have no access to the private 192, but if I connect to the VPN, this red server here, I, I've set it up, set up a link to it, this SSL VPN is going to pass me through to the red server. And there it is. Pass me through to the red server. So, um, let me see if I can go back. Oh, yeah, uh, I want to go to the SSL VPN. So, so that SSL VPN, it's, it's bridging that connection, right? Allowing me to go through. In previous versions of, of the NetScaler firmware, even if you had a self-signed certificate, the client would run and then you would you'd have full access to your back end or whatever access that you would want to, to use. And I've done that in the past. It's pretty nice. So you just hit, basically have to get a real certificate or copy the certificates over to your client so that it accepts this as a, uh, accepts a self-signed one. Now I want to connect you to one of the pages on the back end here has a bunch of credit card numbers. And uh, I'm going to move the demo over to SSL. Not, it's a, one of the security features which is known as the Web Application Firewall. So it's a Layer 7 firewall that is one of the features in the NetScaler. And, you know, it can do all kinds of things, like help you protect against SQL injection, help you protect against buffer overflows, help you protect against, um, you know, really all the OWASPs 10, OWASP 16, whatever, different um, security issues helps on that and one of them is data protection or data leakage let's say whatever whatever your company is you got some people let's say you're a bank you have credit card numbers you have account numbers that are on your systems right if someone were to hack in so let's say somehow they do hack in and they try to copy credit card numbers out well they would just, if they got in, they're going to get your numbers, right? But if you use a NetScaler, and this is basically, this is 100% you know, seamless to the user, unknown to the user, it can block this stuff out. And I'll show you how that does that. If I go to, so let's leave this window open. Let's create a new window, uh, a new tab. Here I am going to the through the NetScaler, so through the virtual IP 10.0.5.105 slash testcc.html, that's the, where the location is, the NetScaler has X'd out those, you know, it, when, when it re replies with the data, it recognized what, what numbers or credit card numbers and it X'd them out. This Australian bank card was not recognized as American Express, Diners Club, um, MasterCard or Visa, so it left it alone. And some of these other numbers were just left alone because they were not recognized as be, to be protected. And we can see that if we look in the if we look into the Nescaler uh, look into the configuration for oh, security application firewall profiles this is the profile I created it's called uh, I just call it give it a name web application firewall RGB for the for the RGB servers if I get into it should be able to edit it you can see what I what I've uh, activated here's just a list of the, 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 the checks that you can have so I won't go through, go through all these, but start URL is a way to force a user to go to the start page. You can't, what's known as deep, deep um, surf. Like if you know the long URL, whatever, um, you can't, it blocks you from doing that. It blocks you from going deep into the website. It forces you to start on the start URL. And it will learn that. It will learn um, all the deep connections in your website and force mm -hmm. you. You know, cookie consistency, book buffer overflow, credit card. This is what we are dealing with right here. 
And as you can see, what I talked about, these are the cards that are it, it is protecting. American Express, Diners, Discover, uh, JCB, MasterCard, and Visa. And, that, and I told it to exit out. See this, X out. You could block it. You could tell it to block it, which would block that site, uh, block that page from be, being returned. It'll block any page that has a credit card number on it. But I decided to do X out, which X's out everything but the last four digits. And it does it automatically. So this is a security enhancement that you can drop into your, your network, right? Without changing any code, without messing with anybody, just drop it in there and you basically are saying, I'm filtering for any data leaving my infrastructure that if it has a credit card in it, and of course it could be a PESL number, social security number, whatever it is, you can, you can, you can specify what that, um, what that number sequence looks like and you can exit out or block it or whatever. So that's just, that's a real <coughs> simple um, demonstration of that. What else did I want to show you? Um, oh, when you create these security profiles, you need to bind it either globally, which means that all traffic will be affected by that, or you can bind it specifically to a V server. So in this case, I bound it only to this V server, this RGB V server, this this uh, load balancing V server that sits in front of the three R in the, the RGB in my uh, in my example there. So any questions so far? In summary or in conclusion. <laughs> We talked about the models, the various models of the NetScaler. We talked about some use cases. We talked about the deployment topologies, how you can deploy the NetScaler. I gave you just a very, very quick demo. I mean, obviously, you know, the NetScaler training takes five days. The, the street price or the list price is $5,000. Um, so that's it. there's a lot to cover. Um, I'm offering the course in three days, virtual and a lot less. So stay tuned for that information. But um, yeah, so are there any other questions based upon what you saw? Any questions? Maybe you might want to use it or think about using it. If you want to play with it, just have some fun with it, check it out. It's very, I don't want to over complicate things. It is a very complex uh, appliance, a very complex virtual machine. But if you take it in baby steps, and on my channel and on my website, uh, n90x.info, I break it down into bite-sized pieces. You know, how to install it, how to set up a load balancing server, how to do SSL VPN. Um, I break it all up into little bite-sized pieces so that it's much easier to, to handle. So, question, what's the competitor's DKP? F5. F5. F5, yeah. F5, PKP. F5, yeah. In this region, F5 is very actually pretty strong, but in pretty much the rest of the world, Citrix is dominating. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't know, you got you know Gartner? Mm -hmm. Gartner surveys. I, don't, I haven't seen 2015, but in 2014, Gartner had F5 just a little bit ahead and a little bit to the right of Citrix, Netscaler. But they're both in the upper right-hand quadrant, sort of in the middle there. And, um, you know, Citrix probably is neck and neck with F5. But look, Gartner is just, that's just one person's, one company's opinion, right? You know, if you look at a lot of the metrics, and there's been a lot of bake-offs between F5 and Citrix, Citrix tends to perform a lot better, especially the more complicated the traffic is. Um, just the way it's designed, the way it's architected, it seems to be a much faster architecture. But um, I haven't tested F5 myself. Certainly if F5 wants to hire me, Test it out, you know, I'll be happy to do that. But uh, yeah, that's those are the that's the biggest competitor. And one important note is that Cisco, Cisco is um, end of life in their um, their um, appliance, their their you know web balance, whatever, ADS, their application delivery system, and they've partnered up with Citrix to take over that business. So that's actually um, you know very interesting that. Cisco went with Citrix and not F5 to do that. So I don't know what, you know, obviously there's, you know, I don't know that they've ever worked before in the past, but um, maybe that's a, 
a positive reference, you know, for for the for the appliance. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for coming. <laughs>